Welcome to Orange Coast Unitarian Universalist Church on Zoom and in person. My name is Jan Maybe, and I am your worship associate today. I am joined by Reverend Sean Wilshire, our minister, Beth Syverson, our director of music ministries, and Karen Magoon Pearson, who is our director of religious education for children and youth, who is not at the park today. Okay. We want to welcome back our children's first Sunday service in two years. So yeah, OK, awesome. We welcome you this morning. We would also like to recognize the many volunteers that have helped put this service together today on the slideshow. We respectfully recognize that our church property rests on a Hachiman and Tongva land. As Unitarian Universalists, we have many different beliefs, but we are one loving community. We are bound together, not by a common set of rules or beliefs, but rather a covenant. A covenant is simply a promise, a promise that whatever our beliefs, we accept one another and encourage each other in spiritual growth. Growth. Our affirmation that all life has inherent value and that all existence is interconnected. We strive for justice and compassion in our deeds and relationships, and we are committed to creating a welcoming community without regards to the traits that sometimes divide people. To our rumors, we invite you to silence your cell phone. For our Zoomers, we invite you to open your chat and say hello. I want to extend a special warm welcome to visitors. If you are seeking a spiritual home, we hope that you will find it here. Later in the service, we will have an opportunity for you to introduce yourself if you'd like to do so. Let our worship begin with the lighting of our chalice as we say our unison affirmation. Love is the spirit of this church, and service is its law. To dwell together in peace, to seek truth in love, and to help one another. This we affirm together. should we celebrate Easter today and sing the Alleluia of joy? Well, Easter is the promise. It's the promise of the planets and their turning, the infinite infidelity of stars and suns and seasons. Easter is a winter promising to spring that earth shall yield its death to life again. It is the growth promise of the dormant seed, the barren meadow, and the naked bough. It is the birth promise of all creatures that have life breath and being. 
Easter is the promise that the heart shall be reborn as hatred dies and love is given birth. It is the promise that the mind shall be renewed as ignorance is lost and newfound truth is, is found. Easter is the promise to everyone who journeys from death to prejudice to the life of understanding. Easter is a promise to everyone who dwells within the light. Lo, Easter is a song of life which springs from death, a joyous human song, a forever alleluia song. And we have a special celebration this morning of a special alleluia song just for the children. Feel free to sing along. Ages story that we've had in two years. We're going to have the children stay in their seats, but I'm going to invite Karen Mogoon Pearson, our Director of Religious Education. Some of you may not even know who she is, so she's going to come up here and join us as we tell this story. All right. 
Let's see here. So uh, many years ago, in a mountain valley watered by quick rushing streams and shadowed by great forests of beech trees, there was a village of small wooden houses. The people in the village were of the Unitarian religion, and they wanted to build a church. A church set on a hillside, they decided that way it would look down upon the village like a parent watching over their children. And so they organized. Okay, stonemason, cut great blocks of gray stone and then set the stones into stout and sturdy walls. Window makers, make glass panes and fit them into windows with leaded lines. Carpenters, let's those, see those beech trees? Let's use them as beams, lay the trusses for the ceiling. Roofers, create some shingles so that they won't leak a drop of rain. Oh, and as you go, go to the city and bring back a bell that will ring beautifully from our tower. Weavers, you get to decorate our beautiful interior, embroider cloth with flowers and lace. Okay, <laughs> now that we're done, let's everyone get together and paint. And the painters mixed bright colors, royal red and shimmering gold and brilliant blue, and everyone in the village came. They painted flowers, they painted trees, they painted designs across the windows and doors, and when their church was finally done, all the people of the village stood back to admire it. <laughs> Let's go rest and eat, and later tonight we will come back to pray and worship. And so the villagers trudged down the hill, happy and content with all their hard work, all except one little girl named Zora. Um, organizer? Um, I don't think we're finished yet. It's such a grand place, but what about light? The church will be dark when the people come back. Ha ha ha! The light of the church comes from its people. You shall see. And later that evening, the bell rang out to call the people to worship. The sun had set behind the mountains, and night was coming soon. Yet in the growing darkness, tiny points of light came from many directions and moved steadily up the hill. You see, Zora, each family is entrusted with a lamp. Each bring their light to the church. The many lights moved closer together, gathering into moving stream, all headed the same way, growing larger and brighter all the time. When they arrived at the church, families hung their lamps around the sanctuary. Soon the church was ablaze with light in every corner. After the service, the families gathered their lamps and walked slowly back home. So the light of the church comes from its people, but also people take their light from the church. And even when we are not in church, even when the lamp is not lit, we carry the light of truth in our minds and the flame of love in our hearts to show us the right way to be. That light, the light from truth and love will never go out. And always, the light of truth and the fame of love that the Unitarian Church in a small village on the hillside in a little corner of Romania continued to grow and show them and us the way. And just like this story, so we take the light of love and truth from this flame here. and light our lamp as a symbol of the love we carry with us as the children and youth go to their religious education classes. So let us sing them out with our traditional song. Easter egg hunt today. I've missed that song. Anybody else miss that song? 
Yeah. It's great to have them back. So our first reading today is uh, by Reverend Kara Root. She's a radical Christian who has something interesting to say about the resurrection of Jesus. She wrote this. In some ways, our faith, she's talking about her Christian faith, would be far easier if it ended at the cross. We've got that part of the story down pat anyway. Then Jesus would, Jesus would be just a great teacher, a martyr for love, an example of justice, a witness to peace. We could package the religion and hand it out freely or for a price and consume it with confidence and rest easy at night because we would know what we were getting, at least for the most part. But a resurrected God? Oh, heavens. Who knows what could happen? How does God appear now? Where? What rules will God break next in God's persistent pursuit of love? This thing could go on forever. A risen Lord is dangerous, unpredictable. A resurrected God means Jesus Christ could meet us anywhere, in anyone, at any time. A simple conversation and Jesus could be standing before our eyes. Hold someone in their grief and Jesus is felt in that embrace. Speak for someone with no voice and you're hearing the Christ. When that friend brings a meal to your hunger to your hunger, and that sister sheds tears in your brokenness and that unexpected person ends up hand in hand along you, alongside you in your time of upheaval, it's messy, it's unpredictable. It doesn't abide by the rules, this God who dies and is resurrected thing. It's certainly not a neat and orderly religion that we can wield as we would like and put to bed when we're finished with it. Instead, it breeds the uneasiness of indicating that it seems not to be finished with us. The tomb is empty. Christ is risen. God could be anywhere. Anything could happen. So this morning, I invite you into a spirit of meditation. And I want you, if you're on Zoom, you can go to gallery view. I want you to look at all the people there and people here in the room. I invite you to look left, all the people there, and look right. Where could God be right now? And maybe someone was looking at you. When you're ready, please join in singing. I think we've said the word Jesus or Christ in this church for a long time. <laughs> That's okay. You guys are good breathing. You're okay? All right. Well, if you weren't aware, we're in a very liminal and sacred time across three different religions right now. And one could argue, actually, that there's actually a fourth, which is pagan religions, which most of them hearken back to, but that's a whole nother sermon. But the three faiths right now have kind of a rare alignment uh, that's going on. There's the Jewish, the Christian, and the Muslim faiths, right? For the Jewish faith, Passover has begun. I believe it started on Thursday or Friday. Uh, pa Passover is that time when Jews give thanks to God for being led out of the darkness of slavery into the light of a new land. 
For Christians, of course, it's time to mourn the death of their prophet, Jesus, on Good Friday and celebrate the joy of his resurrection on Easter Sunday. In the Islamic faith, we're celebrating uh, Ramadan, where they fast from sunrise to sunset and say extra prayers in commemoration of their prophet Muhammad's first revelation from the angel Gabriel. Now, all of these religions, right, have these myths that they tell, the story that gives their faith tradition meaning. As Unitarian Universalists, we like to think that, you know, well, we're science-based folks, and we don't really believe in myths. But we don't need to think of myths as something that actually happened. Instead, we can think of myths as something that happens over and over and over and over again. The history of religion is less about what actually happened than it is about humanity's relationship with the holy and with one another. If we can look at these stories as metaphors for the human condition, we can mine them for wisdom. And let's face it, not all stories have wisdom in them. Some are just plain wrong. But we, are, we take from them what we can because they do speak to all of us as individuals and as communities. So I want to look at some of these stories, what they tell us about ourselves as humans, as individuals, and as communities. So let's start with the earliest of these, the story of Passover. It comes from the book of Exodus in the Hebrew scriptures. Passover tells of a community that comes together to make sort of a bid for freedom against an oppressive, oppressive regime. Passover is remembered through the ritual meal of the Seder, right? The Seder is not just about historical facts, but about participating and passing on the memory of freedom. The Seder is about imagining what it must have been like to be a refugee. You can see where I'm going with this, can't you? to flee without warning to a land you don't know much about. The famous Jewish matzah balls, right, you're thinking? This is of unleavened bread. It's a reminder that they had to leave in a hurry, that their bread could not rise. And they are asked themselves, what might it be like to leave everything behind? Now, the Christian Easter is unlike Passover, which is really about a whole community. Easter is a bit more about the individual. It's about what we may go through in our lives, the death and the resurrection of each of us. We've all got a story. I, I'm guessing most of us have, have a story of a death and a resurrection. It's a letting go of who you thought you were. And mine was dying to the old person I thought I was, the businesswoman who flew around the world and started up offices and all the things, but who was also incredibly uptight and struggled to have compassion. And when I died, that is when I let go of who I thought that person was, I found out who I really was and my call to ministry. It was a very long, hard journey through darkness, giving up my job, my home, my financial security, and ultimately my identity to come through to the light to find out that at the core I was a compassionate person with gifts of love and ministry to offer the world. And these journeys are often forced on us through burnout or layoffs or illness or divorce or fleeing from a war-torn country. Whatever our journey takes us, the Christian story tells us that if we keep going, keep hoping, keep having faith, resurrection will occur, that we will come out of the tomb and into the light and Ramadan. So this last Wednesday night, I was invited to go to an iftar by our friend Akbar. If you remember, Akbar came and spoke here in February with us uh, to the uh, Islamic Center of Irvine to join other civic leaders in this iftar. And if you didn't know, iftar is the meal that's taken after sunset when, uh, by Mus Muslims in the holy month of Ramadan. It's often a very communal meal, um, and there's quite a lot of rituals with it. Like you start off, always the first thing you eat is a fig, um, which I thought was really interesting. They have a, a brand new imam. He's only been there for like three weeks. It's uh, Sheikh Mustafa Umar, and he helped explain why they're fasting during Ramadan. The imam told us that this is not just a ritual with historical meaning to it, but it has spiritual truths. Muslims are asked and are reminded of and are asked to remember that those that go without food, those that are suffering, those that are hungry, thirsty, and oppressed. Ramadan teaches them to practice self-discipline, sacrifice, and empathy, and thus encouraging generosity and compassionate acts for others. Now, each of these stories of Passover, Easter, and Ramadan are stories about going through hard times. That's why they've endured, because we all go through hard times. 
but that we come out on the other side into the light. So what about us? What about our, our Unitarian Universalist stories, right? Well, we're kind of lucky, right? We have six sources that tell us we can, we can use all of these stories to mine them for wisdom, right? We see these myths as they occur over and over again in our own lives and the world around us. And we do also build new stories, such as a story about a small village building a church and everyone bringing their light and love to the world. But it's easy to read about a myth or to hear a story. It's much harder to actually live through it, right? In our next reading, Victoria Weinstein, she's a Unitarian Universalist minister um, back east. She helps us remember how to live our faith in the story of Easter. She wrote this. The stone has got to be rolled back from the tomb again and again every year. Roll up your sleeves. He's not coming back, you know. He's not coming back unless it is we who rise for him. We who lay healing hands on the reviled and rejected like he did on his behalf. We who rage for righteousness in his insistent voice. We who love the sinner even knowing that the sinner is no further off than our own heartbeat. He will not be back to join us at the table to share God's extravagant banquet, God's love feast. All are invited, all are welcome. And so it is you and I who must feast for him, must say the grace and break the bread and pass it to the left and dish up the broiled fish or pour the wine and pass it to the right and treat each one so tenderly as though just this morning she or he made the personal effort to make it back from heaven or from hell, but certainly from death to be at our side. Because if by some miracle, and why not a miracle, if by some miracle he did come back, wouldn't he want to see us like this? Wouldn't it be a miracle to live for just one day so that if he did, by some amazing feat, come riding into town, he could to look around and say, ah, this is what I meant. And we could say, yeah, it took us a long time, but we finally figured it out. So let us live to make it so, because you are the resurrection and the light. Again, I want to invite you into that sense of meditation of just take in that reading. And I want to ask you, how might we all become the resurrection and the light? What does that mean to you? When you're ready, let us join in singing. Now, me personally, I love talking about these stories and myths and the metaphors and how they come into our lives. But, you know, talking about them and their meaning will just get you so far. What we really need to do is to live the myth. Now, most of us know or most of us don't believe that there's some sort of deus ex machina, right? No God that's going to suddenly appear and save us all from everything, not from global warming, not from racism, not from the war in Ukraine. It's up to us mere humans 
we are the resurrection and the light. You see, these myths, these stories that we tell all, this, all these years, they're about waking up, about awakening to our own potential and hearing the call of love. Whether it's to fight for freedom for all, to die to our prejudices or addictions, or to be grateful for what we have and compassionate for those who don't. And let me tell you, this waking up is not easy. You guys wake up in the morning and you jump out of bed, right? I don't know about you. I, I told you, I think a, a few weeks ago, that I have this alarm that the light slowly comes on, right? It wakes me up gently out of my slumber. It's a light rather than alarm. And if it goes for half an hour, then little Tweety birds come on and say, hey, wake up, Sean. It's so lovely, right? I'm on that edge of sleep and wakefulness, and it's so warm and snuggly. I have the window open so it gets cool, right? I have no worries yet, no decisions to make. No mistakes have been made yet. This is how often we begin, right? Spiritual journeys often begin in that kind of slumber on the edge of waking up. We prefer to stay warm and snuggled in our comfort zones. We don't want to have to change to open ourselves to possible failure, to possible death itself. And the thing I like about the Jewish, Christian, and Muslim prophets is that they, they didn't run into their roles all like, yeah, sure, I'm happy to be on the cross, no problem, right? Like, they didn't do that. It was hard, and they didn't want to do it. Moses, right, remember when he was asked to lead the, the people out of Egypt, he, like, argued, and he's bargaining with God, right? He tries to even hide for him in, and go up into the mountains, for a long time, and then after a while, it's like, okay, I got to go deal with this. Uh, and one of the funny things I heard is that this is one of the things I love about Moses is that he's always arguing with God. Like, come on, give him a break. You know, they're really hungry and tired. You know, that kind of thing. I learned there's another story in the Islamic tradition on Wednesday is that originally when uh, Muhammad got the revelation, he went up to heaven, he got the pro met all the prophets, and God said, all right, I want people to pray 100 times a day. And he was like, oh, man. And he goes to Moses. He's like, man, I can't believe God asked me to do this. And Moses is like, yeah, go back and negotiate. <laughs> I love Moses. He's great. And so he does. He gets it down to five times a day. So, you know, it goes back and forth for a while, right? And, of course, Jesus asked uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane, right, please let this cup pass from me. I don't want to have to do this. And Muhammad, he was, if you read the Quran, he was like grabbed around the chest. It sounds almost like a heart attack as Gabriel was trying to give him this information. And he's just squeezed tight, right? Made him tremble, worried. He was worried he was going to die. But the call of love is not easy. And sometimes it's downright inconvenient. It asks us to give up our comforts and routines. And I remember this happening a while back, about 20 years, in my, 20 years ago, in my first Unitarian Universalist congregation in Woodville, Washington, the congregation was faced with a dilemma. You see, they wanted to tackle homelessness in the Seattle area, and they had agree, agreed to be a site for this homeless encampment called Tent City, which I don't know if they ever had it down here in California, but these were encampments of homeless people that would go from one church property to the next, and usually they were housed there for about three months at a time, and then another church would take them. And they'd signed up to be uh, to host, be a host family for Tent City about six months down the road because they give them plenty of time to accommodate the Tent City on their time on their site. But the church that was supposed to take Sin Tent City at the last minute backed out, and the Woodenville UU congregation were asked if they could take Tent City. It would mean dropping all of their carefully laid plans, and it had to happen in a matter of days. Love is not always convenient. People were afraid that would be too hard on the congregation, that no, we needed to plan things, we need to get ready, that they didn't have enough people to make it work at the last minute, and they voted, and love is not always easy or convenient, but they did it with flying colors. They simply needed to wake up to their own potential, to realize as a community that they were powerful. And we Unitarian Universalists, we have such an opportunity before us as well. It's not convenient, and it kind of needed to happen yesterday, okay? As many of you know, millions of Ukrainians are fleeing their country in search of safety, and the Biden administration has agreed to take in 100,000, okay, giving them what's called humanitarian parole for one year. 
But getting that paperwork to like fly from one country to an, over here actually takes months. But there's a little bit of a loophole. If you can get to Tijuana, you can come across the border there pretty easily, relatively easily. And what started out as a trickle of about 50 to maybe 300 a day has now ramped up to their maximum of 1,000 a day. They take 50 an hour. And the border is quickly turning into a, into a humanitarian crisis as people have to wait to be processed. Let me explain a little bit also what refugees go through. This is from what I understand. That in order to get to the US, they have to prove you have a financial sponsor, that you have someone that to go to, whether it's a friend or a family member. Most people have those as they come through. They arrive after flying through many different stops, going through Europe to Cuba or somewhere in Central America to Tijuana, often arriving at midnight. They are met by volunteers, which is entirely grassroots. There is no government agency at all helping with this. None. Zip. It's all grassroots. They take them to a shelter, uh, a gymnasium has been created by the mayor of Tijuana, or if they can, they pay for a hotel if they can actually find one. Right now, it's about 1,500 people are, are on the streets in Tijuana sleeping on the sidewalks. Once they arrive, they're given a number as to when they can cross, and the border process is about 50 an hour. They might wait days, and the black backlog is getting longer and longer. Many, as I said, are putting up tents along the border, and there's, as there's no room in hotels or shelters anywhere. Once they cross to the US side, they can then get to their final destination, which might be, a friend, as I said, a friend or a family member, a host family in another state or, co or county. But it takes time to make the travel arrangements, and they need to rest and recuperate from their ordeal and anxiety. The average time for providing temporary housing is about 48 hours. They want to get where they're going, right? <laughs> They've been traveling or waiting for, you know, often weeks. Now, there are a few people helping out with this, but maybe only three, maybe four churches that are helping that I'm aware of. I spoke to one of them uh, in a sense to get what might be needed if we were to do such a thing. His name was Pastor uh, Matt Palm of the Hope Church in Vista. And he said that they take in about 100 people, now they're a larger church than we are, at a time who are sleeping on mats and mattresses on their church floors. They had someone donate a portable shower, and the average time that they're there is about 48 hours, he said. They take people to the airport if needed, or to get a car, some people just go on Uber, whatever it is. He told me that, other, that right now there are 1,500 Ukrainians sleeping on the sidewalks in Tijuana. As he spoke to me, I could tell he had a cold, and I said, wow, man, you're dealing with this cold, you're picking up the phone to talk to a stranger you don't even know, and all during Easter weekend, which you know for Christians is a huge deal. They've got like four services they have to do. And his reply was this, sister, if we can't do this on Easter weekend, what are we here for? Amen, Amen brother. We are the resurrection and the life indeed. Long ago, in a small corner of a Romanian village, built a Unitarian church. Through their love, they brought their lamps together to be a light for one another. And this morning, Nancy and I are going to ask you to be a light for others during our town hall meeting. It won't be convenient. It won't be easy. But we hope it will be full of love, hope, truth, and light. We're going to ask you to live the myth, not just read or hear about it. And what that will be will be all up to you all, to all of us. So let us live the myth. Let us sing out the glory hallelujah, and let us wake up and get moving. Let us sing.
Unitarian Universalist congregations are fully self-supporting, meaning that members and friends raise all funds for the operating budget, ministries, and programs of the church. We are ever grateful for your gifts of time, treasure, and talent. OCUUC amplifies that spirit of generosity by sharing one half of the plate we receive with an organization that shares our values. This month, we are supporting Community Action Partnership of Orange County, CAP OC. Here's a video with a story about how CAP OC can help people. So I, you know, you know, um, doing, doing well, well. Um, doing, doing well, well, working hard, hard making, making it, it, and blessed, you know, blessed, blessed with, with um, my, my everyday lives, lives our everyday lives, lives has been great, great until the COVID-19 um, happened. happened. I've, I've been doing, doing my part as a citizen, paying my taxes, <laughs> um, working, and I must say, it, it's, it's been a blessed year for us um, until this happened. Hi, my name is Lily, and I've been supported by the Community Action Partnership of Orange County. The pandemic is obviously just, just didn't affect me. It affected the whole world. It affected me, huge financial crisis, affected my children because of the school. Everything has been kind of a big change, a big experience. It's very sad. It's very sad that it's happening. It's still impacting a lot of people. It's still impacting me. I've been working since I was 60 years old, and this is the first time I have applied for unemployment. Just even filing an employment is hard enough, and you don't know if you're doing it correctly. When I actually got referred to Marisa, Marisa, and then Marisa referred me to Maria from Capsi, and that's when I reached out for help for um, what kind of resources do you provide when it comes to homeowners and um, other financial help. The pandemic has affected um, mostly the low-income families in the different communities that we work with. Capo C has been able to assist them in navigating resources throughout our partnerships through other agencies and we're able to leverage some funding to assist these families either through emergency food or emergency diapers, um, rental assistance, utility assistance, and also providing them with the support they might need need if they're going through stress and anxiety that the pandemic has caused. I must say Kapo C um, was easier to reach, easier to communicate because I did reach out to other resources. I didn't even got a call back. I did not even get anybody calling me or telling me what I need to do. But Kapo C right away they reached out to me. They guided me, they uh, told me what kind of resources that are available, so it made it my life easier. You can support the church and this organization. You can mail a check, you can go through our website, use an app called Vanco Mobile, or send a check. The choice is yours. All the information is on our website should you need it. As always, thank you for your generosity. Across the blue 
sky above our heads, the sun's warm rays come to right now. The wind lifts spirits from our kingdom. Our love song reaches to newfound heights. Join us as we sing our offertory song. Now is that time when we honor the important events and people in our lives. This is the weekly ritual that we call Joys and Sorrows, and you are welcome, one and all, whether you are a member, a friend, or a visitor, to participate. I would like to invite Judith Stamper up here. She's one of our pastoral care team members uh, to assist us. So the idea is if you've come here today holding something close to your heart, moments from the last days, weeks, or even hours, something that struck you at your core, if you'd like to honor such a profound joy or sorrow, you are invited to do so. If you're a rumor here, you're invited to come forward to light a candle in honor of that joy or sorrow. And if you'd like to share the joy or sorrow with the community, you can write it on a slip of paper that the ushers have over here that maybe you were given when you first came in here as well. Just simply hand it to me as you come forward to light your candle. If you're a Zoomer, you are invited to then write your joy or sorrow in the chat. Um, and uh, Judith will then light a candle for you um, as we read those out loud. So as music is played, I invite you to silently offer healing or celebration as you feel called and according to your own beliefs. Thank you. 
So from the chat, Don Hart says he has a joy for all the help and concern from the UU members during his recovery from quadruple bypass surgery. Uh, yeah, he said fulfilling words to help one another. That includes meal train, Grubhub gift cards. He says, I'm feeling better every day thanks to you. Mm -hmm. We're glad you're feeling better, Don. That's awesome. Sherry Lushen, uh, she uh, would like a candle lit for celebrating Bob's back surgery, which went really well. Mm. Yay. You can't, I don't know if you can hear the applause, Sherry. There you go. Let's see here. And Matthew uh, Patterson, you know, is, is dealing with sh a temporary shortening of hours due to his surgery and appointments and then, but he has a joy of celebrated Passover Seder with the Temple Emmanuel via their stream last night with his husband, Alex. Blessed Passover and also Happy Easter. And I want to point out if anybody has any uh, financial challenges, to simply email me and we'll see what we can do. Email or call, either way. All right. Uh, and here in the room, Shirley Thorne uh, lit a candle of joy. She said, for a wonderful few days in the desert with my daughter from Santa Fe. And uh, Maureen McConaughey also has a candle of joy for something sim uh, similar. She says, I got to visit my daughter, Abby, in Tucson. Mm -hmm. Did you guys run into each other? <laughs> Santa Fe, Tucson. <laughs> All right. And Mifanwi, uh Kaiser, she has a joy, she says, for her volunteer teaching at the Orange County Rescue Mission, and especially my students who are working on their first, first book of poetry. Well done, Mifanwi. And Sarah Hunter says that she also lit a candle of joy, she says, for uh, her son Ian, who is visiting um, them from Atlanta. She says he is an example uh, to us of true uh, giving all of ourselves in love. This guy is really cool. He is. And Jennifer Wolk also has a candle of joy. She says, Rivka, my son's grandmother, we found her name on the wall at Ellis Island last week. She was the same age as Ben, 13, when she fled her homeland for the new world and a new life, a gift to us all. Mm. So glad they made mm -hmm. it. Right on. And Tatiana Hauser is lighting a candle of joy. She says, for having a wonderful Ukrainian refugee family at our home, she's hosting them from the border. She said, it's been a blessing meeting them. <laughs> says, it's a blessing meeting them and we are so glad we can help. And I also want to recognize that we have a very special guest and that she has brought uh, one of the uh, refugees uh, here with us today from Ukraine. And so welcome, we're really glad that you're here. There she is back there. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. Oh, and I forgot. I don't want to forget this one. Bob Melville. He has, uh, he would like a candle lit. Thank you. Uh, he said, Easter Sunday is a special joy for me because 75 years ago on Easter Sunday, I became a Unitarian by joining the First Unitarian Church of Los Angeles until 1961 when the merger happened between the Unitarians and Universalists, and he became a Unitarian Universalist. All these years, it's been a real joy for me to be with people who think and act like I do. Bob is awesome. All right. Let us now hold in love all the joys and celebrations and all the hurts and sadness, whether they were spoken or silent. Let our joys remind us to be thankful, our concerns remind us to hope, and our sorrows remind us to connect. Let all these moments remind us that we are not alone. I invite you to please join Judith in a spirit of prayer or meditation. Prayer of Risk by Tamara Labak. Holy One who has given us the breath of life, today we remember to breathe deeply, to rest, to take in, to pause before we act, and then to take in another deep breath poised on the edge and risk jumping in, risk taking action, risk speaking up, risk using the gifts we have been given 
so that at the end of our life, we can say with absolute clarity that no part of our existence was wasted in fear of failure or fear of success. Hold us. Prepare us the way to begin to offer the gift of our awakened presence, full of love and light today. These and the prayers of our hearts we lift up now in the silence. Amen. Let us join together as we extinguish the flame of our chalice and say together, we extinguish our chalice, but not the light of truth or the warmth of community or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Thank you for joining us this morning. We are a congregation made up of people who all believe differently. And yet, when we are together, whether we are in a room or on Zoom, we make up one loving community. We need not think alike to love alike. If you are a guest, a visitor, or someone who hasn't yet been known to us, I invite you to become a part of this beloved community. We encourage you to either write in the chat if you're a Zoomer, or if you're a roomer, we ask you to stand for a brief moment and tell us your name and where you are from. We will bring a microphone over and hold it for you so our Zoomers can hear your name and where you are from. Hi, you wonderful people. My name is Tatiana. Is the mic on? I came today with a wonderful Ukrainian family that are staying with us. Um, their names are Maria and Andrei. <laughs> and their, their uh, cutest thing, their daughter, uh, six-year-old Kira, is now uh, with the kids mm -hmm. over there. So they, um, they joined us yesterday, and they will stay until Thursday. They have a plane to Hawaii. They have an opportunity <laughs> to uh, stay with someone, another uh, uh, Ukrainian woman who's uh, lived here for a long, long time, and her American husband, they will be hosting them and uh, helping with work and... Um, then from there on, they don't know yet what they will they will do, but there are many people who are helping, um, thankfully. And uh, we have uh, another uh, wonderful woman as well staying with us, Tamara. <laughs> and, uh, Tamara is with us uh, for a while. Um, there is a family in Minnesota that are inviting her. Um, to come and join them. So uh, that will happen sometime um, next week or the week after, or maybe later, we don't know yet. But we're so grateful to have them. This has been an amazing, amazing experience. Just, I can't compare it to anything else. Um, so, so happy to have them. So please welcome them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tatiana, for your hospitality and for bringing them. Thank you all for coming. Do we have any other visitors? What about on the chat? Okay. If you'd like to know more about our church, including programming for our youth and children, please contact us at hello at ocuuc.org, and we will help you get connected. In addition, we invite you to sign up for our weekly email called BLAST at blast at ocuuc Dot org. We want everyone to feel a part of this beloved community, so please reach out and we will help you get connected. Okay, I know we've got a lot going on right now. It's really exciting and we 
we've got this town hall meeting that's going to happen about 10, 15 minutes after the service. We'll get settled. Go get your coffee. Go get lunch. Go to the bathroom. Whatever you need to do. And then come back. Um, we know it's going to be a little bit crazy today. We've also got an Easter egg hunt going on out in the courtyard with the kids are there. I want to remind you that, you know, most of our kids, uh, uh, particularly the little ones, are not vaccinated. And so the parents would really appreciate that if you're going to interact with the kids to make sure you put a mask on right? Um, that would make the, the parents feel very, very comfortable. So I want to mention that. Um, next Sunday, we have a new member ceremony. If you're interested in becoming a member, Linda, where are you? There she is. See this absolutely wonderful person uh, right there, Linda, and she will uh, get you connected with all of that. We've got a, a wonderful bunch of people who are joining this church. So, um, and uh, last but so not least, pledge drive. Yes, we're still in that. Okay, Sandy, where are you? There's Sandy back here. Okay, see Sandy? See those gray hairs that she has? Many of those gray hairs are for trying to get people to remember to pledge, to fill out their pledge drive. So let's not give Sandy any more gray hairs. You have time after the service to go fill out a pledge card. She'll be out in the courtyard. If you're online, Kathleen McFarland, she's putting a link in the chat that you can click on right then and there and go fill out your pledge card. Don't wait, don't go, oh, I'll do that later this afternoon. No, no, do it right now, do it right now. Make Sandy happy. Let's keep her hair beautiful blonde. No more gray, no more gray. All right, all right, thank you so much everyone and please stay for this town hall meeting. It's very exciting what we've got planned. Nancy and I have done a lot of thinking and working and talking and research about what we can do and we're really excited about this. Um, and inspired a lot because of Tatiana. So, all right, let us join in singing our benediction. Resurrection. This service is over. Let our service continue.